right? The real moral hazard of, of uh, the, the government monetary policy is by pegging the, the interest rates to zero or ne- and by yield curve control, they've demonetized the currency or they've, remo- they've eliminated the currency as a store of value for savers. And that means they forced retirees, it doesn't matter retirees, it doesn't matter whether you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, or 70, they were forced non-financial investment professionals to take risk. It's been a rocky start to the year for Bitcoin, but experts still say it will hit $100,000 and that it's more a matter of when, not if. Despite the volatility and recent slumping price, many experts still say Bitcoin is on its way to passing the $100,000 mark, though with varying opinions on exactly when that will happen. And a recent study by Deutsche Bank found that about a quarter of Bitcoin investors believe Bitcoin prices will be over $110,000 in five years. Bitcoin's price dropped below $20,000 on Saturday as investors continued to bail out of risky assets amid macroeconomic uncertainty. Several factors are contributing to growing economic anxiety, including surging inflation, a shaky stock market, rising interest rates, and recession fears. The crypto market has increasingly tracked the stock market in recent months, which makes it even more intertwined with global economic factors. The stock market had a short-lived rally Wednesday afternoon following the Federal Reserve's decision to raise interest rates by 7 to 5 basis points, the largest increase in 28 years. But the crypto market was unable to muster a rally, which could be a troubling sign for some investors. With no end in sight, the war, inflation, and shifting monetary policy in the U.S. will likely continue to drive more volatility in the coming weeks and months, experts say. MicroStrategy is famous for owning more Bitcoin than any other publicly traded company. As of June 14, the Virginia-based business intelligence company holds 129,218 Bitcoins, more than two and a half times as much as Tesla, the next largest Bitcoin owner. That Bitcoin is now worth about $2.9 billion, less than half of the roughly $6 billion it was worth just two months ago. MicroStrategy chief Michael Saylor believes so deeply in the promise of the primordial cryptocurrency that the company took out a $205 million loan from Silvergate Bank to buy $190 million worth of Bitcoin in April. But since then, the cryptocurrency market, which was already slumping, has gone into free fall. In a new interview on the Northman Trader YouTube channel, the MicroStrategy CEO accused the government policies and programs for the present inflation, which has led to the present crash of crypto stocks and other assets. While you listen to Michael Saylor, please don't forget to smash the like button. Thank you. I think that the economy of the world, like I would say Western civilization, but maybe I actually think the entire global economy peaked in January of 2020. I think if, if I think about January 1st, like New Year's of 2020, just before you know we got hit with COVID and I think about how the world worked, you know, the concert business was raging and travel was raging and the airlines were, you know, were working smoothly and the hotels were on fire and small businesses were on fire and there's entrepreneurialism everywhere and an explosion of yoga studios and, and specialty everything. I, I think we kind of hit the peak of this entire business cycle then. Everybody was able to go about their business unfettered. We had a little bit of uh, monetary inflation in the system. And so it wasn't like things were perfect. Uh, they weren't perfect. But, uh, you know, compared to what came in the next two years, you know, which is just unprecedented government intervention in every aspect of our lives, to t- telling you who could come to dinner, how far away you had to stand from your kids how many masks you need to wear, how many vaccines you need, whether or not you're all, you, know, you can go to the gym, whether you could go to the office. You know, so many things happened uh, that intervened with the free market. And they're all restraints of trade, uh, creating massive inefficiency. And all this, I think, policy intervention unprecedented across every dimension of life. You cut a war on carbon, a war on, on corporations, a war on, on uh, foreigners, a war on trade, you know, a war on COVID, you know, I, I could go on and on and on, but wars, uh, wars are unprecedented policy interventions by governments in our lives. So if I go back to January, and I just picked like January 1st, 2020, while we were still innocent, and before 
before uh, COVID hit and then the war on currency hit, et cetera. And then you go forward to today. And I look at, at what happened. Well, the money supply, the M2 money supply of the US dollar expanded uh, by my chart, 41%. We expanded the money supply about 41%. Um, now, how did all the assets uh, behave? Well, gold is up 20% since that day. So the gold captured half the money, money supply expansion. It didn't track the money supply. What did track the money supply? Uh, US uh, single family homes up 45, 46%. You know, we all know the story of home prices exploding. So single family homes uh, slightly outpaced that money supply. And of course, granted, the money supply is like an imperfect government metric. You know, they give you their best estimate with a one or two month delay. So, I mean, it might be the single family homes are about at the money supply. Um, NASDAQ, the index, 19% from that date. up So up 20%, but the money supply is up 40%. The S&P index up 13% from that date. Um Bitcoin up 185% from that date. So, you know, and if you picked a, a broad commodity index, I, I bet, uh, I think the commodity index up double the US home. So, so you would have beat the money supply slightly with desirable real estate. You would have beat it with commodities. You beat it with Bitcoin, which is like a basically synthetic digital commodity, but a scarcity. You wouldn't beat it with gold. You wouldn't beat it with NASDAQ stocks. You wouldn't beat it with the S&P index. If we had bet 250 million on Bitcoin, or, sorry, 250 million on gold, it would have been down 10%. Gold is down 10% since August 10th, 2010. So gold got a boost in the first part of the crisis, but then it kind of flagged. Uh, NASDAQ is like flat, minus 1%, 0% went nowhere for the entire 18 months. The S&P slightly up 11%, single family homes up 26%. The money supply up about 20%, maybe 20, you know, 25% depending on how you count it. So again, single family homes tracking the money supply. Bitcoin, even as it's been thrashed right and left, up 86%. If your um, time horizon is less than a year, you're a trader. Even if it's less than two years, you're sort of a trader. <laughs> And if you're a trader, you can be right or wrong about anything in that 18 month time frame. You know, you could have said you're an idiot not to buy Amazon stock when it was whatever, and you're an idiot not to have sold it after it doubled, and you're an idiot not to have, right? You can just drive yourself crazy if you're a trader. And so that's why I don't really, I don't join with the traders. I just don't know it. I think you need to have proprietary expertise of some sort. Year to date, the, the two year, you know, is, has gone from 76 basis points to 310. So I, I think we got on a wild roller coaster from a macroeconomic point of view, starting in March, 15 days to stop the spread. You remember the 15 days stop the spread? Two years have gone by, two and a half years have gone by. My office is like 10% occupied. There's no 15 days, not 15 months. Call it uh, four years after that happened, we will get to a new normal and we will never go back to the old normal. So macroeconomically, if you're looking for any good idea with a time horizon of less than two or three years, even four years, you're just a trader. And I think you know there's something wrong. There's a moral hazard to making 90 nine percent of the population traders right the real moral hazard of of uh the the government monetary policy is by pegging the the interest rates to zero or and by yield curve control they've demonetized the currency or they've removed they've eliminated the currency as a store of value for savers and that means they forced retirees, it doesn't matter retirees, it doesn't matter whether you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, or 70, they were forced non-financial investment professionals to take risk, forced them to take risk. And then the cruel joke of it all is, in addition to destroying your savings account 
and destroying sovereign debt as a store of value, they also have put equities on a roller coaster. <laughs> so that, you know, if you look at if we look at the roller coaster of the S and P index or the Nasdaq index, if I can't buy the bonds, I got to buy the index, and they put the indexes on a roller coaster, and they put them on the roller coaster by, you know. I, I don't know if your memory is good. You might remember, you know, a certain head of the head of a central bank saying we're not even thinking about raising interest rates until the year 2024. So what what by the way, is it 2024 yet? The, I mean, the irony is you're sitting there watching interest rates at zero and and they're saying, well, it's four years. OK, well, two years later and, you know, we're getting a 75 basis point jump. Watching the screen on a gas pump while filling your vehicle's tank is liable to induce a panic attack. Paying for a used car almost requires taking out a second mortgage. Speaking of mortgages, members of the middle class are being priced out of the housing market as home prices march relentlessly upward. Many price increases are out of control. How did we get here? A little over a year ago, and in the years before the COVID-19 pandemic, most prices were relatively stable. But more recently, general price inflation is in a 40-year high. An increase in government spending is one of the factors that economists say can drive inflation. Other factors include interest rates, monetary policy, supply chain disruptions, and fluctuations in demand for goods and services. Inflation can be an important consideration for investing, saving, and borrowing. The volatility is nothing new and is a big reason experts say new crypto investors should be extremely cautious when allocating part of their portfolio to cryptocurrency. Bitcoin has shown as steady a rise in value over the years as any other cryptocurrency on the market. It's only reasonable for Bitcoin investors to be curious about how high it can ultimately go. Unfortunately, Bitcoin's price is extremely difficult to predict and even more susceptible to market factors than more established asset classes. As with any investment, financial planners and other experts advise against letting Bitcoin's price fluctuations lead you to emotional decision making. Studies have shown investors who contribute regularly to passive index funds and ETF perform better over time thanks to a strategy called dollar cost averaging. We believe that dollar cost averaging is the best way to invest in crypto, especially in this volatility time. What do you think of Michael Saylor interview? Do you agree that the government policies is the major cause of the inflation and the crash of different assets today? Please let us hear your opinion in the comments. Thanks for watching.